My friends over at Roosevelt's, they make the most incredible shirts. And and they they have everything from Disney to The Office to Jurassic Park, WWE, and everything pop culture. Nickelodeon, Nicktoons. My son and I fight over the shirts that we get shipped to us. Use promo code SWOGGLE. Save 20% off any order from button-ups to hoodies to activewear, everything. Guys, go to roosevelts.com. R-S-V-L-T-S dot com. Use promo code SWOGGLE. Save yourself 20% on everything. R-S-V-L-T-S dot com. You're listening to the Major Pod Network, the only place where your favorite toy store, card shop, arcade, theme park, and arena are all on the same block. Scratch that major itch. Hello, it's me. This is Dylan. That's George. And this is Going Postal. Uh, This is a podcast where we talk about life in, out, and under the wrestling ring. Oh, that's... You like that, didn't you? That's my co-host, George. He's my writing partner, producer extraordinaire of the Going Postal podcast. He co-hosts... An awesome other podcast called the Game Marks Podcast. With who? Caroos! Uh, t- today's episode is sponsored by our good friends at the Roosevelt's clothing brand. Roosevelt's.com. That's R-S-V-L-T-S dot com. Use promo code SWOGGLE. Save yourself 20%. I love this interview because... I feel like a lot of my listeners, I feel, don't know about Tony Chimmel. My nose is itching like a son of a bitch right now. I keep itching my nose, and it's actually like inside my nose, but I don't want to be called out for picking my nose. That's something I go through in life doing. Like, in my car, if I have to itch my nose, but it's inside, I put my finger in my nose. And then I go, oh, am I picking my nose? Does this constitute picking your nose? Uh... But Tony Chimmel, I feel like I was saying, I feel like um, Tony Chimmel doesn't know, or Tony Chimmel is someone that a lot of people don't know a lot about. And uh, we talk about a lot of things that a lot of people wouldn't know he was a part of. And then we talk into about video game stuff. You had a question that we brought up. I did. We talked about uh, his his interactions with the video game world when it came to WWE stuff editing this uh this whole interview together i think it is like you said very interesting because i don't think a lot of people know a lot about tony chimmel so this is a very interesting backstory into how he got into the wrestling business the connections that he had you know prior to him even getting involved with the wwe uh and then just you know his time there the the other activities that you guys got into while you were on the road the topic of you guys playing gin comes up I never would have thought that Din- dylan Postle is a big gin guy i still play gin to this day i usually on wednesday afternoons at slades me there it's my afternoon cards it's myself an 87 year old man an 85 year old man and a 53-year-old man playing cards on a Wednesday afternoon drinking Diet Pepsis. That's what we do. And that's how I feel like, man, I'm getting real old. I'm getting real old. I'm, I'm playing cards on a Wednesday afternoon. I'm sure that there's a lot of people that would like to be in that kind of situation where it's yeah. a Wednesday afternoon and they're playing cards. Yeah, and you know what most of them are? Retired. Like that, that, that's, but 
it's it's a hobby that I don't think a lot of people expected you to have. I don't I love it. I'm going to teach Lana. Caught Crib- me off I'm guard teach, while uh, I was listening to the interview. I was like, I'm going to teach. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to teach Lana cribbage soon. I really want to teach him okay. cribbage because I was about his age and I was doing cribbage tournaments with my dad. Which sounds like a Jackbox game, to be honest with you. It's because it makes me uh, think that of is, fibbage. It's fibbage. <laughs> cribbage is fibbage. That's the Jackbox game. But uh, yeah, I really like this one, and it made me just happy. I. Whenever I see his his big dumb face, I just smile, and it's and his little plug sign that he had holding up. Oh, oh guys, so... this is one of the ones. Obviously, you can go and watch the free video versions of all the other small talks that Dylan's done over the course of us doing this podcast, and even prior. But this is one that I almost need to recommend the video version more because they're just. There's so many moments where Tony holds something up to the camera, either to pop himself, to get a rise out of Dylan, to just... This is his life. Like, this is what he does to me, just to exactly what you said, get a rise out of me to pop himself. And I it made me miss him, man. It made me miss him. I love that, man. It's perfect. Well, Dylan, without any further ado, uh, you can do your little clap or snap your fingers, whatever you want to do. And be throwing this on over to your uh, small talk with Tony Chimmel. Here we go. Mad Cat Beard Care. They are the absolute best. They make my beard feel soft, silky, smooth. But not only that, they've been a one-man show since 2019. Mad Cat Beard Care uses a portion of sales to care for local stray cats, cover their medical bills, find safe spaces, and forever homes. Their products are made to order with vitamins and all natural oils that promote strong, healthy hair and moisturize your skin as well. Mad Cat Beard Care has exclusive scents for myself as well as other wrestlers such as a childhood favorite of mine, Delirious. Ring of Honor legend with his lime and French vanilla scent that makes my beard smell and feel amazing. And of course, make sure to try my exclusive scent swaggled with nuts of lavender and sage and guys make sure to use promo code swaddled to save 15 percent on your whole order at madcatbeardcare.com and remember the mad cat makes a happy beard and start guys uh, no one told me about that that's <laughs> <It's> good <laughs> It's going to be a fun one. Another small talk with this time with the man that wears many hats. None of them fit well. Uh, the second je- best gin player in the world. Really? Everyone is tied for first. Chimmel? <laughs> yeah, sir. Chimmel, you've been requested by absolutely no one. We've ran out of guests, obviously, as you can see. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, <laughs> but I had to have you on. Uh, hi, pal. How are you? Really? Well, I upped, <laughs> uh, upped the ratings on Bradshaw's show, and uh, now I guess I got to do you the same, the small favor. No offense, of course, but uh, I am doing fantastic. Life is great. Life is good. You're in Florida. You're out of the normal seasonal weather up in Jersey, just loving life. Yes, uh, I, we moved out of God's country north about three and a half years ago. Now we're in God's country south. I what can be it. better? And we do have the seasons. We have summer and then we have hot. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say hot, hotter, or rain is your three seasons. That's what you have. You don't have the four. Right. It's do you great. miss the snow at all? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Dude, I don't even miss the cold. And you know what the <laughs> great part is, is that people down here, a lot of them are like, oh, I can't wait. The fall's coming. The fall's coming. No, no. You don't want the fall. You don't know what the fall is, okay? To you, the fall is like cinnamon sticks <laughs> and you know, maple leaf cookies or something like that. No. The fall is when that you get the wind chill factor and that wind <laughs> fucking blows and all that bullshit that I fucking hate. 
Done. <laughs> Hate it. <laughs> We're not a minute in, and there's the first rant already. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Among many more, you know, what can I say? <laughs> you got to turn your light. There we go. Guys, He's gonna. it's going to pop up. Book yeah, Tony Chimel at gmail.com. Book mean, Tony Chimel at gmail.com for the your time. signings, your Don't convention. Don't I, I, I literally Love have it in Chimio. my notes. I have it in my notes to plug the cameo and in Chimio. parentheses, Chimio. <laughs> These are your chimelisms, and I was gonna bring it up later, but these are some of the chimelisms that just drive people bonkers. In the production office, when someone would ask your email address, and it would be Tony dot chimel at oh, that's the A with the circle around it, of course. Yeah, I have now most people I have know that is A T. That's correct. Stolen this, and it gets the same reaction. It did every time for you of just, just, just the, the blank stare of, we get it, we know what it is, and then explaining it more, and the same reaction. What are some of the other famous chimelisms that? Well, don't uh, forget, you know, if your email ends in a dot com, it's not d o t com, it's just the period dot like com. You know, <sighs> I speak English. I don't speak technology. And I speak Jersey English too. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you did you grow? I I forget because I I don't really listen to you a lot of the time when we do talk. Right. Uh, when did you grow up in Jersey or in Philly? Because now, you claim I grew up in South. <laughs> I grew up in South Jersey, which basically is Philly. If you're from North Jersey, that's New York. If you're from South Jersey, that's Philly. So yes, Philly's my hometown. It was my hometown airport. So yeah, if if I say if somebody says, "Hey, where are you from?" and I say, oh, "Willingboro, New Jersey," they're going to be like, "What the hell is that?" Why wouldn't you, know, you just what? say New Jersey? Okay, because you don't know. You can't just say New Jersey. You got to decipher North and South. So I would say so I'm from South Jersey. Then you know, or I would just say I'm from Philly. You but know? you're not from Philly, right? I'm from that Philly area. So if you're from Nevada, you could say you're from California? No. If you are from <laughs> this is you see start. you see why this is always an argument uh always something that was uh, very argumentative when you would bring up that you quote unquote from Philly. If you're from a small town yeah. Okay. Where are you from? Oshkosh, Bagosh or whatever. God's country, Oshkosh, yes. Okay. No one knows that. You're from Green Bay. No, no. I say I'm from Oshkosh, which is direct center of Milwaukee and Green Bay. Oh, so now you're mentioning Milwaukee and Green Bay. Right. That's not so another mentioning... state. That's not What's another state. What's your airport? Appleton. No one even knows that town. <laughs> <laughs> so, girl... <laughs> <laughs> So you grew up in Jersey. Yes. Okay. And Lived if I remember like right. 40 years. You, okay. You grew up next to Gorilla Monsoon? Yes. Or you, yes. And is that's how this whole thing started? Correct. Yes. Yes. They moved into our neighborhood. This was probably the late 60s. 1960. Uh, but yeah, they moved in in the late '60s. I was probably about seven or eight years old, and uh, Gorilla moved in like four or five houses down. And he had a son, Joey, and uh, Joey was about the same age. He was probably like five or six then back then. But uh, yeah, we all hung out together, and you know, did you know of Gorilla Monsoon being this star of sorts immediately? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, we kind of we cut kind of, yes because. You know, then we, as we were getting older, like nine, 10 years old and stuff, we all watched wrestling on Saturday mornings, yeah. you know, and we all knew. And, uh, you know, we knew his dad was big and stuff like that. We knew his dad was Gorilla Monsoon, you know, and, you know, being nine or 10 year old brats, you know, we would always give Joey a wrath of shit, you know, wrestling's fake and your dad's fake and all this other stuff. But, 
you know, Joey took it well. And, you know, but there was one time where, you know, I was getting on his case and, and one time there's a knock on our door and there's gorilla standing there, you know, and my dad answers the door <clears throat> and there's gorilla at that time. He was probably like 400 pounds, six, eight, you know, huge wrestler, nicest guy in the world. But he just kind of told my dad, hey, can you give my, you know, tell your son to write <laughs> up a little bit. On my, my dad's like, sure, no problem. I'm on it. You know? <laughs> so your dad and Gorilla weren't close like you and Joey? No, no. I mean, okay. neighbors, you know, but, yeah. you know, because Gorilla was away a lot, too, you yep. know. But uh, always had a, a freaking Cadillac in the driveway with the kayfabe license plate. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all like, what is this K Fabe? You know? Oh, that was that was was the license plate. Yes, it said K Fabe on it. Yeah. Oh, we're like, why does your dad have this Kifabi Kifa or whatever? Kifabi. <laughs> Kifabi. <laughs> <laughs> so when you know, what age huh? what age were you when you started like would you just did it did it go from oh yeah, I mean you were talking about earlier how you kind of raz joey a bit about the wrestling yeah we were like you know eight ten years old you know just stupid kids but how does it go yeah. from razzing him to i'm assuming attending shows and then doing like being a part of and working right, so, on shows yeah, we were friends first and just growing up and you know hanging out you know after school and stuff like that and you know i went to the, the catholic school because i was a well-behaved good kid and joey went to the public school you know but <laughs> after after a while um after a while you know i think joey was getting into a little bit of trouble and gorilla wanted him to have a little bit more discipline and, and go to the catholic school so i'm in so they were getting ready to send him to, to holy cross the high school that i went to so one time i'm sitting in the lunchroom and the the principal comes over father father laforge and he says he's like chimmel do you know this uh gorilla monsoon joey morella he's coming to, he's going to be coming to a our school. And I'm like, yeah, I know him. He lives right down the street from me. We're good friends, you know? And he said, uh, he's like, well, his dad's a professional wrestler. I'm like, yeah, it's Gorilla Monsoon. You know, he's like, well, he was, uh, he was in our office. We were signing Joey up to come here. And I told him that the tuition was $700 and Gorilla said, okay, whipped out a wad of money out of his pocket <laughs> Undid the rubber band because that's always how he had carried his money and handed him <laughs> 700 bucks right there. <laughs> you know, like most it, of our parents are like struggling <laughs> making monthly payments yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> Gorilla pays the 700 bucks right there in cash. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, then we went to high school. You know, he wasn't in the same grade. I think he was like a year younger than me. But, uh, you know, we were in our neighborhood we grew up we were always playing every sport whatever was in season you know baseball basketball football we played street hockey we did all that crap you know and then uh you know as we grew up we just became close and you know there's probably about freaking five or ten of us that always hung out together you know at different times and all that and uh you know uh gorilla owned part of i don't know what it was called but before you know when vince's dad owned the company uh, Gorilla owned part of it. I think it was Vince's dad, Gorilla, uh, Arnie Skolin, and this guy Phil Zatko out in Harrisburg. And uh, and Gorilla had a ring. And Victor Quiones would, would do the ring, but he would also bring Joey and he'd bring us like, hey, you know, during the summertime or Christmas break or something like that. Hey, do you guys want to come down to Baltimore? Or, you know, you want to go to Harrisburg or do you want to go up to Scranton or something like that and uh, set the help set the ring up, you know, and, you know, that was for we, that was for Gorilla's company. You said not no, that was for, that was for Vince's. That was for oh, okay. I guess Vince's dad. But uh, he owned, he didn't own the entire business. Okay. It was Vince's dad and like three other people, Gorilla, Phil Zatko and Arnie Skolin. And uh so we would go for Gorilla. I guess he had a ring and we would go and help set up on weekends, like I said, or whatever. And it was like, yeah, who don't want to get out of town, you know, and go yeah. have some fun or whatever and go set up a ring or whatever and get paid for it and come back the next day or whatever. But that's how, you know, basically got started just doing that stuff. 
And then when Vince's dad died, uh, Vince, I guess, bought out the other three. So he bought out Arnie Scola, and he bought out Gorilla, and he bought out Phil Zadko. And I think, I'm not positive, but the rumor that I've heard was, you know, he bought them, them each out for a million dollars. And if they wanted to work for Vince, I guess they would have a, a contract for life or whatever. Phil Zatko just took the money and ran, but Arnie and, and Gorilla yeah. stayed with Vince. I took the money and worked for Vince. And then that's when Vince or Gorilla lost the ring. So we weren't doing that. And then uh, a couple weeks later, I guess Vince called Gorilla and said, hey, do you, you want to have your son work for me? He can set up the ring and tell him to bring a buddy, you know, because he's how old were you guys then? I was probably well, it was eighty three when I got hired, so I was twenty two at that point. Okay, okay, you weren't. I was so twenty two. You were well the, when we were doing this stuff for Gorilla. We were probably eighteen, nineteen years of age okay. and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, when I first got hired, I was twenty two. And so then, and then it was it pretty much immediately on the road on the road or just when they were in that. Yeah. Area? But you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like real far trips. I mean, we would do a portion of the country where we would do, you know, because you got to figure every month they did the same towns. We would do Baltimore once a month. We'd do Washington once a month. We do Philly once a month. We would do uh, Harrisburg once a month, Wilkesbury or Scranton once a month. We do, uh, you know, I'm trying to think. So we do like the Meadowlands once a month, you know, all these different places. And uh, waiting for the comment. That's not Elmo. That's Animal. That's not Elmo. Yeah, what's the difference? They're all Sesame Street guys. I, and, I, you I, know. I, I was waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> God, you drive me nuts. <laughs> okay. So. So it was just it was it was pretty consistent on the road, uh, yeah. Even yeah. Ring in that. And, and I mean, we go out to Pittsburgh, you know, yeah. probably as far as Pittsburgh, maybe Youngstown, you know, up to Erie. And then, uh, if I remember, it's it's transitions from ring crew to taking jackets just because they needed a body, essentially. Yeah, I mean, you know. <sighs> When it first started out, yeah, we would just set the ring up and, and go hang out at the ring truck and do nothing, you know? Yeah. I, I think we used to argue about who would have to go in there and hang up the tag ropes. <laughs> <laughs> Such a tough job. Tough, real, real rough job. Well, nobody wanted, neither one of us wanted to do it, you know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, we would just do that. And then as it started to build a little bit, it was like, oh, no. You know, now we need someone to take jackets. Well, you got paid a little bit extra, so I don't care, you know. Then they needed a timekeeper, you know, and then then they started playing music, which, you know, we played the little ghetto blaster thing and the uh at uh, at ringside that was? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah, we they would have a uh they would we would have a, a little, you know, one of those little stereo gimmick things, whatever. And uh, you'd have a line that went into it and you would they'd have a cassette tape made of the talent and you'd put that cassette tape in, press play and boom, it would play through the you'd either put a microphone up to the speaker or you'd have a hard line that went into it, depending on the building or the sound had. system. Yeah. Into the sound and system. Go wow. right into their sound ah, system. Ah. I would have never thought about that. You guys would just do it off of cassettes back then. That makes perfect sense. You know sense, what a cassette though. tape is. I know it. You don't I had, even know what a cassette I, I sure tape did. Is. I sure do. <laughs> I had the I had a bunch of soundtracks, and then I had a Ninja Turtles cassette when I was a kid. The hell are and the Ninja Turtles? I had uh, the best of Billy Joel at the time. Nice. I liked That's that a good one. one. I liked that of one. Course. I remember that. Uh, <laughs> God, you're the worst. <sighs> so it goes from that. To jackets, to your your most notable quote unquote job, uh, ring announcing, and again, is that just hey this guy missed his flight or has travel issues, so we need someone? Why don't you go talk? Yes, uh, that happened one day. Uh, I think we're in. Do you East remember Valley. the? 
I okay, don't remember the same. exact date, but I remember I, we were in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, Joey came to me and he said, uh, there's no ring announcer here. Arnie wants you to ring announce. And I'm like, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. I, I can't <laughs> ring announce. I don't even know what to do. He's like, all you got to do is just sit by the table at ringside and announce the wrestler when they come out. Do you know and about like, what year this would be? Are we talking 80, uh, like early 80s? Probably late 80s? probably uh, late 80s. Okay. Late so 80s. Who is, who's on the bill, are we thinking? Uh, Tony Atlas. I remember announcing him. Uh, it was at East Stroudsburg High School, I think. And But I'm like, I didn't know if I wanted to do it, but Joey's like, <laughs> Arnie said he'll pay you 50 bucks. And I'm like, ooh, 50 bucks, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I ended up doing it. I just sat at ringside and, you know, I was like, you know, making his way to the ring, Tony Atlas, you know, making his way to the ring, Tony Atlas. It's all about the props sometimes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're the carrot top of ringing out saying uh, book Tony Chimmel at gmail.com. He's on cameo. Chimio, as he calls it. Chimio. Yep. At, and then at the the Twitter is at Tony Chimmel with a bunch of numbers that really we can't decipher. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, how I started doing that. And you know, that was like a kind of like a one-off thing, you know, doing that. And then um, you know, it just it never really came to be but you know i would i'd be sitting at ringside and watching guys like mel phillips and you know frank chisnowski and all these other guys frank chisnowski was a guy that announced in like hartford only hartford so when we so did they only people, have did they have certain ones that went to certain markets it wasn't like a hey fake, right yeah you're gonna be on all the time well mel phillips did a lot of the house shows okay uh but you'd see howard at like the garden <clears throat> maybe like a New York show or something like that. And now at this stage, we're I'm sitting, you know, either taking jackets, playing the music, timekeeping because he got paid 50 bucks for jackets, 50 bucks for timekeeping, uh, 50 bucks for playing the music. So you could pull in like 150 cash, you know, if you did all three. Okay. All right. So I'm also, st I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm watching Bell and I'm doing this and, you know, and and then after, you know, I forget there was probably some other show or they just said, hey, you know, bring a suit with you in case an announcer doesn't show up or anything. And that's how. And then as they started expanding and doing more shows, you know, Mel might be at this show, but I was at another show, you know, and that's how I kind of got started as announcing because the company was like, well, he's got to be there for the ring, you know, you know, he's going to be there. Why are we paying this commission guy? Or why are we paying this other guy? We can pay him. Oh, and, okay. And he'll do both. He'll be, at the, he'll be setting the ring up, ring announced during the show, tear the ring down. And that's the same thing with the referees. You know, it was like Joey would Joey would uh, would referee and do the ring, or Kyoto would referee or do the ring. And, you know. That's – so I was going to bring that up later about how – at house shows or live events, you would still be doing ring crew every show along with announcing. And it's kind of nuts how it started that in the eighties. And then that was always your job throughout. It was always setting up the ring and doing that along with ringing the bell, along with announcing, along with taking jackets, how it, there was never other people kind of assigned for those other jobs at live events. That just always stuck with you being right. a ring announcer. Yeah. And, you know, the way I looked at it was, you know, you can't have a wrestling show without a wrestling ring. So if I'm on the ring crew, they're always going to need me, yep. you know? So that I've seen the, the wrestlers come and go and come and go and come and go and other people come and go and do this, and you know. But the ring guys, you know, they're there a long time. You know? Was that always the same, um, always a certain road crew for that, or was it always locals? And like well, once they started expanding, they had, a, they had a, like, 
me and Kyoto were doing the Northeast. Then you had like Yaton uh, up in New England with D'Amico or for the Dawson's or something like that. You had a guy in uh, Florida, Ricky Hunter. You had somebody in Texas, I think. Mike Toomey, who was a guy in New England, they shipped him to California. So he was doing a lot of California stuff. And, you know, so we all had our little areas of the country that we would cover, you know? So. So it wasn't, you... when did it start then of kind of branching out from your areas or your, your, your towns? Well, I think, I think in Cal, something happened to Toomey and he wasn't working with the company anymore, but they had a ring out in California. And uh, I remember a lot of times me and Yaten would fly out to Sacramento. We would rent a Penske truck or a rider truck, go pick up the ring in a cage and do like, you know, Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, and then come on, drive all the way back, you know, put the ring in the cage back in the, in the storage bin there in Sacramento, drop off the rider truck and then fly back home. You know, you talk about the cage. I have to ask big blue cage or the wire cage, which was more of a pain in the ass to set up. Uh, the blue one was definitely heavier. You okay. know, you could back in those days, not now, but you could carry one of the fencing pieces by yourself. And I have loaded that in a, a truck the, like the that. metal, the, the new metal issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the fencing cage is, it was better than the blue one, but I think they liked the blue one because the camera guy could get in there a lot you better. You could see without. through it more. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's, that's such a part of my childhood and your mid adulthood that like, I always <laughs> remember that transition from the blue cage. And then I went to a black of that cage for a bit. And then I went to the fencing. Really? The blue, the black one? It went from I'm the sure blue to the black to the fencing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, the I black... think James wanted the blue because he didn't, he didn't want, he didn't like to have anything that like WCW had or NWA or whatever that league was. Okay. Or whatever, but he, and they he had the fencing. WWE to be different and it's okay. all thing. All right, so now we're getting into ring announcing stuff. We're you're, you're doing that uh, essentially full time, and I have to ask because it's been brought up many times with you and I in conversations about not only my favorite band, not only the WWF's favorite band, but the world's favorite band, Limp Biscuit. By <laughs> far the fucking worst <laughs> announcement. <laughs> <laughs> tell it tell the story when because Yates, there, you when told Yates, me <laughs> you told me this one this was when at we were right it was at wrestlemania uh 19 seattle. wrestlemania 19 in seattle they're one gonna do the two performances yeah but yay he goes he's like jim they want you to introduce the band and i'm like okay and he's like they want you to say Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to WWE's favorite band in the whole world, Limp Biscuit. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Who? <laughs> what? This I... is hurting me because they were my favorite band growing up. Really? My favorite band growing up. Oh my god. <laughs> so continue. So continue. With, that's it. So I had to make the announcement, and it sucks. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> I remember you saying to me, "Yeah, Bruce Springsteen. It's not Billy Joel. It's Limp Biscuit." He it's said, "Not the Kings or the Who? Who, is, who the fuck are these guys? The Stones. The Stones. <laughs> it could have been the Stones." He would say to me, "Yeah." I so if we're on rock and roll. Let me tell you another quick story from a WrestleMania. So yep. I, I announced at some WrestleMania, it was like some matches I did, some matches other people did, whatever. So I was done with my part. So I get unchanged. And unlike the other announcers, I got another job to do. So I go to the production office and I start working there. I know where this, I remember this and one. Sean <laughs> Selman, best boss I ever had. Love me some Sean Selman. Uh, so I'm in there, back there working and he's like, Chimmel. Can you do me a favor? I'm like, yeah, what do you need? He's like, uh, there's some guy named Dan with, uh, oh, who's who's the guy? Now I can't even think of the guy. Kid Rock. 
Yes, that guy. <laughs> this, was Wrestle- this was WrestleMania. This was WrestleMania 25, by the way. Okay, I have no. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he's like, "There's some guy named Dan. He's with Kids Rock Group or whatever." No, no Kid and- Rock. <laughs> what, what did I say? Kids Rock. <laughs> oh, whatever. So, um. So he's like, he's looking for a pack of Marlboro Lights or a pack of Marlboros. Can you go find some from somebody? I'm like, sure. So I I ended up finding like a half a pack of Marlboro Lights. And I go to their door. I knock on the door. I said, uh, some guy answers. uh, And he says, uh, I say to him, I said, is there some guy named Dan here looking for cigarettes? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm Dan. I said, here, I got a half a pack of Marlboro Lights for you. He's like, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You want to come in and meet the band? I'm like, nah. And I leave. He told me this story on the Monday after that WrestleMania. I specifically remember this. And he told it to me in such a way that I know he told about 19 people prior to that. And he had the same infectious smile that he just had about not giving a shit about this. I, this is why you're one of my favorite humans because all of that just rolls off the tongue and you just walk away and have no cares in the world. I'm sorry, is uh, Jimmy Page back there? Robert Plant? I don't know. Mick Jagger? That's- Do I want to meet him? <laughs> I'm not okay. worthy, but sure. Let's okay. Let's stay on that real quick. Have there were there celebrities? I mean, you because you saw literally every incarnation of the WrestleManias and the celebrities coming in and all of that. Were there any that you were like pumped to be around or pumped to meet? I mean, you had the first ones with Mr. T and and. Regis yeah, well, and all that. Yeah, I really wasn't, you know, they were really wasn't into that, the Mr. T stuff. Uh, I probably should have been into Muhammad Ali a little bit more, but they really, you know, they had Billy Martin, but I'm not a Yankee fan. Uh, Here's the Mets thing. Yep. Knew that was coming. Yep. Was waiting on that one. <laughs> I, um, were, they ex- were they accessible like they were? You know, in the during the guest host era, were they were the the first few WrestleManias were the were the celebrity guests and that were they as accessible or were they kind of just in and out? Um, yeah, I mean they weren't. I don't know. It's it's kind of weird. I mean they just never really had celebrities that I was into. You know, okay. probably one of the the biggest things I popped for, which I know you popped even huge, was when they had the 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 puppet people there. You know, uh with all the the stuff. Now, I know that my wife loved it, you know, and she she wanted me to get pictures with them and stuff like that. But I mean, I could, you know, I could care less. That you was know? the best day of my life. The best day of my life. <laughs> oh, and you ruined oh, I it. I met Noah Syndergaard at the WrestleMania a few years ago. One in, um, who's that? actually signed a baseball for me. Who? Don't who Noah Syndergaard. Yeah, he signed. He signed a uh, baseball for me. I like have it? zero idea. He used to pitch for the Mets, okay, but he okay. signed it as uh, to the world's greatest ring announcer. So he signed it to Justin. I'll Let's go. It. There it is. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about the Limp Bizkit thing and the world's best announcer or the world's best band of all time. Were there any other that you can think of odd announcements from celebrities or just talent coming up that you can think of that were like, uh, I don't know about that one. Uh, there was an announcement that I had to make. It was simple. Just, you know, if it was a match, Yaten would ring the bell, ding, ding, ding. And then I would start the following contest schedule for one fall. But if he's just hand cueing me, right. I would just announce the person coming down because they're, uh, they're doing a, a, a promo or something. So here comes Trish Stratus down the ramp and Yankton points to me. And I'm like, what the hell's her fucking name? <laughs> like, Trish of all people I'm do. supposed to say something and like four or five seconds are going by and I'm like, 
It's not Stacy Keebler. Who the fuck is it? Then it clicks in my head. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Trish Stratus. So now I get out of the ring, I get down, and I know I know the truck has got to be fuming because when Yayton points, Chimmel's supposed to talk. You know, <laughs> heaven forbid if it doesn't happen as soon as that. And Yayton comes down. Or I go to Yayton because I sat right next to him. He's like, they want to know what the hell was taking you so long. Would you forget her name? And I said, yes, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> <Not> her name. <laughs> Tell him there, that. <laughs> what's the... What's the the famous one? It was during the gravy boat thing. That's it. <laughs> and why are you wearing earphones? What's that deal about? So I can hear you because I, and I have to take my hearing aid out because I'm 36 going on 80. So I put the headphones on so I can actually hear you in better audio quality. You know they make these little ones that you can. They just don't. Put in. I, they don't work for my ears because I have one really really big ear and one small ear, Tony. Oh, well, all right. I guess my life, you know, just yeah, I know. God bless you. <laughs> I know. But you uh, know, the gravy you know boat. What I love though, you know, when I'm at work and people are walking around, you know, and they got these little earbud things in their ear and they're talking, and I'm like, I'm sorry, what are you saying to me? She's like, Oh no, I'm I'm talking to somebody in my ear. So then I walk around and I'm like, Yeah, that's rude, you motherfucker. And uh, I said, oh, not you. I'm talking to somebody in my ear. <laughs> life of Chim- another, another life of Chimmel. This is like this what happened. They're walking around like they're talking to I'm like, well, they are talking. They are talking to someone. Right. But nobody else knows that. Okay. <laughs> so you're walking around just talking and nobody, I don't know. I'm like, you know, putting something away. I'm like, what, what do you want? Are you looking for something? Oh, no, I'm talking to somebody in my ear. I feel like saying, you know, just, I feel like saying, that's so stupid. Why do you do that? Oh, <laughs> not you. I'm talking to somebody in my ear. You know, it's ridiculous. You, one of the biggest things about our friendship is seeing how much daily life and the world around you just pisses you off. Oh, God. Well, changing with the times is not something. That I don't mind up. changing with the times, but you can't do this. Hello, how you doing? Yeah, what's going on? Oh, I need this. Okay. So we know you're talking on a phone. Okay. I don't know. I know, you know, I know I should change for some things, but I don't know. You know, <laughs> it's change for the better. I get it. Okay. All right. But a lot of times it's not change for the better, it's change for the worse. So that Bluetooth is worse for the world. I don't know. I do know this. <laughs> I do know this. I sat down at an, in an airport the other day, and what's on my armrest? The little ear freaking things that somebody just left. Well, I'm sorry. If they were attached to your ears with a cord plugged into whatever you were doing, you wouldn't have forgot them, dumbass. You know? <laughs> Is it that this difficult? Is, oh, not, I can't have a board. Oh, no. The world's going to come to an end. It's not that difficult. And this is why I miss our life on the road together, along with Larry, uh, the, the trainer with WWE, and Jimmy Cordera's longtime ref. I have it written down that the four of us were a bit of a band for a good amount of time. And there was a day where we were riding together and we got a flat tire. (laughs) You can take it. I remember this St. Louis. (laughs) (laughs) You remember? I I remember the stupid shit. Yeah. (laughs) You could have given me 90 guesses would have never guessed where we were. (laughs) But you don't know. You don't know. I remember the good stuff. I don't know who wrestled what. You know, or this guy. By the way, Kane still hasn't been eliminated from the '98 Battle of War Royal Rumble. Or whatever. You know, it was, it was the 2000s. It was <laughs> in '98. He started in '97. I don't know. I just know he still hasn't been eliminated legally. <laughs> okay. 
Go but ahead. anyway, so we're driving. We all meet up in St. Louis, meet at the rental car place, get in the car, start driving. We're about 10 miles away from the rental car place. I don't know where we were going, but we're about 10 miles away and boom, flat tire. And I'm like, well, why don't we just go back to the rental car place or call them on the, no, that's going to take forever. Let's change the tire. You know, <laughs> let's change the tire. I'm like, I'm not changing no tire on the side of an interstate, you know? So Corderas and Larry proceed to start changing the tire while me and you are standing on the side of the road and every truck goes by. We're like, <laughs> and, they're, and they're beeping the horn as these two nitwits are the- changing the tire. My and favorite. <laughs> About the third or fourth one in, the f- <laughs> Corderas looks up and then sees us just like this, and now puts the pieces together that that's why every semi that walked that drove past on us. Larry, Larry flung that goddamn wrench. <laughs> they were hot. Uh, <laughs> that was fucking great. Oh <laughs> uh, man, we had that those us four, and then there was I was still twenty years old, and it was the Super Bowl that the Packers went to, and we all went to I believe Larry's house for it, and this is when until halftime you guys wouldn't let me partake. Because I was only 20 years old at the time. So I could. No, no that was in some hotel, I think. I that thought was that a, was the Super Bowl. It was a Super Bowl. Oh, no, it was. It, it was at the hotel. Was, I think You're it was right. We had a hotel somewhere where we, we went, had adjoining rooms and ordered yes. and wings and all that. God, that's right. what it was. I think the liquor store for something, we had a day off or something. I don't know. We went to Larry's for the Packer one because it was Packers versus. I don't know football, as you as you know. It was Packers versus Steelers. It was Packers Steelers. Oh, so that's okay. why we went to Larry's house. That's right. But yes, now that you say that, it was at a hotel with the adjoining room that we couldn't and you guys wouldn't let me partake until halftime because I was <laughs> I was uh, still a child at the time. Some would say, um, and still are. <laughs> a lot of gin, not the uh, alcohol but the card the card game was involved in our travels and in the world road life for you probably yeah. some of my favorite memories were on the gin table at the gin table how did that start you are a famous card player you're you're known with the with the on the road gin games yeah. you're one of the the main the main heads of it was that just a was that before you came up Everyone no, was doing it. That was that was when we first started. Arnie Stolen would always love to play cards, and him and Gorilla would play gin all the time. But uh, Gorilla wasn't at all the shows. Arnie was was an agent back then, or producer, whatever they're called these days. Uh, but Arnie would we'd play Crazy Eights with Arnie, and he would love it. And if Andre was there, and you'd play cribbage with Andre a lot. And Andre would just sit there back and drink wine and stuff like that and play cribbage with Arnie, you know, and it just progressed. That's how we learned to play cards. And we found out playing gin, you know, how to play gin and stuff like that. And we started doing that because, you know, you figure you set the ring, you get to a building at like one o'clock, you'd be done with the ring at maybe three, maybe go get something to eat. You still got a couple hours to kill, you know, so we played cards and then it just progressed and, you know. Nowadays, that's something none that, of this. None of this. That, oh, that's another tribalism. It's all that's this. Another thing. It's all that. Not, no this. one uses. No one uses their hands anymore. It's all through the Bluetooth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, was there always? Is there any like Hogan or Macho or Warrior? Any Rock? Any big names that would that like stand out? That would be a part of the Gin Games. Oh, yeah. You know, Cena played all the time. Well, yeah. Yeah. Cena loved playing. I even got a picture here. Here's a picture of me, Corderas, uh, Little Hebner, and Cena playing uh, cards someplace. That's awesome. 
Yeah. That's a good one there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see where that even is. I don't know where that is. No idea. This had to be before that, the show somewhere because there's bottles of water and seven ups and Mountain Dews. Those weren't on normally the, on the tables. No, no. <laughs> you, would have, you would have Sprite or Coca Cola. <laughs> That's something that just stands out of the the, the Cena thing, playing cards with him, and just the big, the big <laughs> losses or the big gains of the card table by the yeah. end of the tours where it would just be guys just either real good on their luck or real down on their luck. Yeah. I mean, we would, you know, you'd play when you're overseas, you know, you're for like two weeks or something, you know, you would play, you know, five, 10 or whatever, stuff like that. And then usually at the end you'd play, you know, double or nothing the last game or something. So if someone was up a hundred bucks or something like that, you could walk away with a couple hundred bucks or something like that. But, uh, those overseas tours are so long, you know, <laughs> God. And now I see how all the rules, all my ideas, all of the things that I was saying 10, 15 years ago now are happening. Oh, less house shows. Oh, not overseas once a month. Oh, but, pay-per-views on a Saturday instead of a Sunday. Oh. I mean, I will say the best stuff happens at the house shows. The absolute well, most fun. Yeah, happens at the house shows tight at a tv there you know the and, and charmel so charmel using you as a chair the all hail king bookers about 900 times yeah, the <laughs> about the i had the when mr kennedy came out and had you stand on the chair to drop him the mic from the ceiling yeah he was the uh, best mr kennedy <laughs> Then, is there any other spots from the house shows that stand out that people didn't see? Well, let me tell you about Mr. Kennedy, the one thing. I loved him. Were you still keeping contact with him? Yeah. Tell yep. him I said hello. Yes. He's the best. So we're overseas, right? And uh, every time that I would announce him, he would, he'd have like a bottle of water and he would spit the water in my face. You know, this happened like four or five shows in a <laughs> row. And I'm like... This is getting a little boring. The same thing every night, you know? So I'm like, hey, I said, let's try it. Let's do this next time. Okay? Chimmel, call, Chimmel calling spots here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but for once, this is a spot where I'm not getting over. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I said, hey, you act like you're going to spit the water in my face. I'll cover up my face real quick, you know? And then you hit me in the nuts. I'll sell the nuts. Ow! And then you spit the water in my face. <laughs> and he uh, loved that. And I'm like, yeah, that's good. We'll do that. Were there any others uh, in the even before that or the past that stand out to you? Uh, as far as what? Gaga House show rain? spot? Yeah, yeah. Gaga. Yeah, well, you pushing me over every time I had to do that stupid little leprechaun kick or whatever. So I forgot about that until you started bringing up the Kennedy stuff. I forgot about that and the stunners so much. I just had <laughs> literally mess. I, I wrote down messing with you from under the ring with the worms. Yeah, and the, with the so, microphone cord. <laughs> they were, Chimmel would Chimmel would be before the shows. How I would get out of the ring is nine nine times out of ten, lights would go out, video on the board, and then a bunch of uh, hands would surround me, like local hands, and we'd slide under. And the, I was like, man, I was bored, and I could see Chimmel through the ring skirt, but he couldn't see me. <laughs> and I wanted, I was like, man, I can use this to my advantage. So there was a time where he was. And now he, it went dark. The lights went out for in between matches for another video or something. And I scurried out and I took his ring bell hammer and I came back <laughs> under the ring and I saw him then go to ring the bell and there's no hammer. <laughs> and he's now going, Oh shit. Where's, where is it? So now he reaches under and I hand him it. And now he puts two, I can see in his face. He put two and two together of that. I got it. So it turned from stealing the ring bell hammer to during the match, I would be pulling the mic from the from his chair. So you just right. see this moving microphone. And the first pe three or four people behind him would notice it. Like this just moving microphone. <laughs> and, he would... 
He right, got smart enough to that. Got a cord on it, yeah. right? And it usually yeah. was plugged in underneath the ring somewhere. So, and I would have the mic right by the bell. So when you ring the bell, you would hear it. So I'm just sitting there, you know, sitting there during the show, and the mic just starts going towards underneath <laughs> the ring, and I'm like, no. Oh, <laughs> so then he, he would he would step on the cord. Well, <laughs> every time he moved his foot, I would pull it real as fast right. as I yeah, could. Inevitably, I have to move my foot. The other thing that pissed me off too was after the match was over, I put the mic on the freaking ring, <laughs> right, and then I have to walk over to the steps yeah. to the ring. By the time I get over to where back where the mic is, you've already pulled the thing down <laughs> off the freaking ring. I have to get down. You know. My favorite was one of them. One of the <laughs> one of the times I pulled it and it hit a little ridge and it literally just goes dunk, 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 over the sound system <laughs> during the match. Well, he then yeah. instead of just stepping on it, he outsmarted me by tying the cord around his chair <laughs> and I didn't know. He got up to take jackets back and I pulled his chair. God. I Boogeyman would have the worms and in the dark I would pull up the apron a little bit and just start chucking worms yeah. at him. That's right. The amount of fun we God. had. Literally, I, me under the ring and just seeing his facial reactions to me messing with him, but him not knowing where I was in front of him. And uh, it was the only the, thing that kept me sane out there all those years. Was the Gaga that you And then have. for a bit, do you remember when Fit and I would play sports during his matches? Yes, the tennis yeah, rack. <laughs> the Batman. <laughs> the Batman, whatever that <laughs> We would. Yes. Fit had this idea of one time he was in a match and he was in a headlock and he just started dri like fake dribbling a basketball. <laughs> yeah. and I go, what are you doing in the match? I just yell, what are you doing? He goes, I'm dribbling. And I go, okay. I said, and I put my hands up like this, and he passes to me. <laughs> so for a whole tour, we would just yeah. switch off sports. And then yeah. we played badminton one time, and I hit it. <laughs> Fit hits it. I hit it. Fit hits it to Chimmel, and Chimmel hits it back. <laughs> it was exactly what you said. That was the stuff that kept us sane, especially on those tours that could be really long overseas. Oh my that God. just made the time fly. Horrendously long. Oh. And then I'd get hit in the head with the shillelagh every oh. freaking show by fit. God, that hurt. He would be doing the, the circle one around. Time I remember we did the show in Belfast, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. He's going to be a baby face here. You know? Even worse. Oh, he can't be even harder. I'm like, <laughs> Because he would stand, he would stand on the chair next to you to yell at the crowd, and as he was getting down, he would whack you. That's right, <laughs> every time. Or if I'm taking jackets, I would have to take his jacket, and the, I knew the shillelagh was coming. He'd be like, oh. going, and then hand it to me. I'm like, ow! I'm like, let me see that seven. All right, so we got yeah. <laughs> seven days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're very famously for that, like in older, older like WrestleManias, and that you literally just popped up. At WrestleMania 10, I think it was, taking the gold chains from Razor. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 That was, it was one of those things that, that made me smile. I was like, man, he is real old. He's not just been around <laughs> for a while. I remember one time taking the, 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 uh, the chains from Razor, and it was at a TV in Lowell, Mass, at that little auditorium. And Razor's handed me the jewelry, yep. and he's like, you know – don't let anything happen to this or you know what's going to happen. And I said, yeah, I'm up shit Creek, you know? So I bring the stuff to the back and Bruce is there. Bruce Pritchard's at gorilla. And he's like, Chimmel, the camera was right over your shoulder. You can't say that stuff on TV. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> the microphone on the camera picked it up. So. Well, it's about time here. Uh, I have to say, you then transitioned from that to running the production office, as you would say. And that transition, was it enjoyable? Did you not like it at first? How, how did that transition come along? No, I liked it. And Yayton was the one that taught me that. Yayton taught me a lot of things. Yayton was the best, you know. Yeah. And uh, 
he got let go too for some unknown reason. But anywho, um, yeah, he taught me how to work production. And, you know, it was always the, the more jobs you could do as a crew guy, as an yep. announcer, as a whatever, you know, <laughs> the longer you would be around. And that's what I would tell these, you know, other ring announcers that I was teaching. I'm like, you know, announcing, yeah, but if you're just an announcer, they're going to change their mind one day and you're going to be gone. Find something else you can do. Get your foot in the door somewhere else and do something else. Because the to me, the announcing gig was just, you know, that was like, oh, that's the easy part of the gig. You know, I can now I got to go back to the real job and, and do the real work. And, you know, Yang taught me how to do that. And I was in charge of money and I learned a lot from him and just doing that. And I really enjoyed it. And I I didn't want to do the ring anymore. I was tired of the heavy lifting. It was nice to sit behind a computer and and do work there and learn other stuff and still know how to do the ring and all that other stuff. And yeah, that was fun. I mean, there was longer days. We'd walk into a TV at seven o'clock in the morning and not leave until midnight, you know? And now when I get on a plane, I'm like, how did I do this for 38 years? You know, I'm like, <laughs> what the hell was I thinking? And I, you know, and I'm yeah. like, you know, back then you just, you didn't think about it. You just did it. You He's know, you pitched and moaned the whole way, but you know, it was, you just did it because that was your job, and you just it was did life. It, it was yeah. life, yeah. You know, yeah. and I made a very good living uh, at it. You know, and it was a great career while it lasted. And you know, I don't feel bitter or anything like that about it. But you know, we talked about producer uh, co-host of the show George Feast earlier, and he had a question for you. He hosts a, uh, a wrestling video game podcast called the Game Marks Podcast, and he wanted to know the process of recording the voiceovers for the video games. Was it awesome? Uh, what was the process like? Did me knowing your your boys, were they all about it when they saw you and heard you in the games? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I used to. That was a great thing to do. That was really nice because uh, I was paid very well. Uh, you know, and to do all the lines that they wanted me to do probably took, you know, maybe two or three sessions of three or four hour sessions, you know, and, uh, it was great just to do, you know, and, uh, you get the video games for free and the boys loved it. You know, the kids loved it here. You know, I never played that Gaga, but you know, the, <laughs> I didn't realize until he said you were in like visually, it, physically in a couple of the games making the announcements. I thought it was just your voiceover, but you were scanned and everything for the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did that a year, a year or two, which was nice. You that's know? awesome. That's that's always always a good perk. Well, pal. <laughs> always, always, always something. Well, Tony. Is that it? You can, that's it. That's all. That's all the time I'm taking of yours. I appreciate this. You, uh, I have to say, you took me under your wing very early to me being on the road, and I appreciate that. Uh, you've always been an awesome, awesome part of my life and Landon's life and all of that. Your wife is like a second mom to me, who I still call mom to this day, and I appreciate <laughs> The amount and she'll of, be very upset if the next time you're down here in Punta Gorda, you don't I look this have up. to. I have you to come down. I have to. I have to see you guys. I will but, come up, but guys, uh, book yeah. Tony Schimmel appearances, signings, conventions, anything, r indie shows. Have them announce your whole show. You can't get Man. that anywhere else. No, have them announce the whole show. Make him do it. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, on Cameo, Chimmel is on Cameo. He can give you that world famous, in his mind, ring announcement like he's done for Edge so many times. He can do it on Cameo as he calls oh, Chimmy. That's right, I do that. Yeah, I've done a lot of those and just announce people, you know, from their own town or even some kid wanted, you know, hey, I'm this guy on the video game. Can you announce me on that? And I'm like, all right, whatever, you know, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, thank you, pal. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for everything. Yeah, and let me just say this, too, b- before we leave. I know Kyoto wants me on his and, and Hebner and Teddy Long of Bass. I, you know, here's the whole thing with these podcasts. I don't get it. I don't get it. This is the, this is the world. This is work to me. This is work to me. Okay? This is the world moving forward, Tony. Okay, so when can I when can I watch this or hear this show or will we watch uh, this will be it? up both actually this will be audio and visual that's why I have you on video. Okay, and like so well I, I wouldn't even know how to tune into a <laughs> podcast if you told me I got no God. idea. <laughs> Another episode of Small Talk in the books. You Thanks. will uh, you will um, email me something. So I can put it on Twitter and then people will hear about it. Is that how it works? Yes. All right, whatever. I'm sure I'll screw that thing up. Guys, let me talk to you about our friends over at Manscaped, bringing you the absolute best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped makes precision engineered tools for your family jewels. The Performance Package is the ultimate bundle in men's hygiene. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for our listeners. 20% off and free shipping worldwide when you use promo code SWOGGLE at manscaped.com. That's promo code SWOGGLE at manscaped.com for 20% off your order and free shipping. Wait, if my math is correct, 7 million men carry the two... That's 14 million balls. All right. George, that was a blast. Uh, I hope people enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed... Um, see, I, I don't know if hosting is the word. I, I, don't, I don't know if I like that word, but... Um, it's hard to call it that when it's like a friend of yours that you're sitting down. It's one thing if it's someone that you don't really have a relationship with. You know what? We'll use your own terminology. When it's not two pals yucking, it's it feels a little bit more formal where I feel like this was a more casual conversation because yeah, you do have that's exactly a long standing history with Tony. Yeah, it was uh it was just like I said in the in the intro, it was so fun to hang out with him again, uh even virtually and just uh just have some laughs and talk about old stories that uh that we both enjoyed all right guys in addition everything that we uh we ask you to follow going postal pod at dylan postal all that jazz head over to wherever you listen to your favorite podcast whether it be spotify apple pod leave us a rating and then if you could write us a review now next episode we're going to be doing a huge giveaway i'm giving away five figures to three winners it's going to be one to one person two to another and two to another so you could win dr brit and thunder rosa's blood and guts that's going to be going to one review you could win owen hart and tomaso ciampa's ringside exclusives that's going to one reviewer and then the Ultimate Edition, Mr. T, that's going to one reviewer. All you guys got to do, leave a review on any podcast platform, and you could be entered into the giveaway for absolutely free. George, did I get all that right? Yes, you did. Leave a review. Hopefully, it's a five-star review. And then, of course, uh, leave something in the comments. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a song or anything, but if you do write a song, we'll make sure that Dylan sings it. Um, but uh, with that, I think uh, I think we've covered all of the bases in regards to the contest, and uh, now it's time for for you to go ahead and do your plugs and stuff. But guys, thank you, thank you very very much for uh, for checking out this episode. I know it's a uh, it's a random one, and that's what I like. I don't like the usual. Um, the ones that you would uh, you would guess I would have as guests. Um, I like the the random ones of people you may not know everything about, 
or may not know what I'm going to come out swinging at them with. Um, and this was definitely one of those. So thank you for checking us out. Uh, all of our socials, all of our socials, all the Going Postal Podcast socials at Going Postal Pod, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all of those. Uh, going Postal Pod. And if you have questions about this episode, past episodes, whatever you got, or suggestions for for future episodes, hit us up at Going Postal Pod on Twitter. Ask your question. Open ended uh, suggestion channel you're leaving there. We're going to get a lot of requests for uh, another Dylan Postal taste test. Maybe oh, I am. Maybe I know it's going to be that. It's going to be another night with Landon. All of that. Uh, leave your suggestions. Ask your questions, and you can win yourself an exclusive going Postal eight by ten sent your way. The next episode that will be coming out two weeks from now, we will be talking about all things Impact. That's Dylan's multiple uh, stints in Impact and TNA. Uh, and then we'll also talk about Wrestling Con in the intro to that episode. We'll talk a little bit about the things that happened. A lot to talk Landon's about. Landon's got a broken things. ass toe. Landon Big broke things his toe. To talk about because of Landon. He, he had a one-day career. <laughs> broke his damn toe. And now he's walking around worse than I am. Uh, he can feel uh, as many. He can feel. Uh, hello, my son. <laughs> oh, here he is. <laughs> the star of ACW can, hey, Wrestling Con. He can Landon feel as many big toes as I can. <laughs> Landon, how are we feeling? Post he's hobbling. Smash. He's hobbling. I had to hobble down and up the stairs. <laughs> you couldn't get Man. the elevator pass, huh? No. They wouldn't give it to you? Ah. Uh, Hmm. All right, get out of here. We got to finish the show. <laughs> Guys, at Going Postal Pod on all forms of social. Also, you can follow, find and follow me at Dylan Postal on Instagram, at Dylan Postal on Twitter. Yeah, DylanPostal.com. We're, we're, hey, a website update is coming. Yes. Not by me. Not by, by me, me at all. <laughs> by George with the helpings of Matt Stein to set up how I didn't know that I bought DylanPostal.com. That's a little peek behind the curtain. Ever this isn't, guys, this isn't going to shock anyone. I bought DylanPostal.com. I didn't know how I bought DylanPostal.com. Can't say that I know many people who have bought a website and have forgotten that they bought a website. <laughs> just like, yeah, I know that I bought it. I just don't know when or where or how or but I know that I bought it. I, my favorite part of that was you and Matt just texting me. Oh, how did he do this? Like in the group chat. And you guys both realizing that it's me you're dealing with. And you both kind of just going, oh, I think we're going to have to do this ourselves. Like, <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's a tremendous help. So I, uh, I greatly appreciate Matt. <laughs> Matt putting up with me asking 20 questions, trying to figure out what the hell you did. <laughs> luckily he he understands the struggle so he he, uh, he was very helpful uh i cannot let you forget dylan the wonderful youtube channel youtube.com slash dylan postal and what's that website where if you want to get like 10 bucks you know, you use guys it auction god oh this is gonna come out after <gasps> no no it's not it's gonna come out the day of landon I need my boat. Guys, if you're listening live on the Wednesday that this came out, tonight on whatnot, tonight on whatnot, at, go to uh, swaggleauction.com, get yourself a free $10, and you can have your very own Lex Luger autographed USS wow. Intrepid. What a signature Lex has. I slammed Yokozuna July 4th. 1993. Did it George. pop him? Is it the, is it a one of one? He said, George, it's coming out. I got full video of it, me with him signing it coming up on the video diary. Yes. He goes, I've never signed one of these. I said, you haven't. And the best part was David C's right there. Chris Bogger's right there. Everybody. 
just watching it happen. These guys were teeheeing at me for buying a boat. I ain't teeheeing anymore. <laughs> You're going to be able to buy a, a, a real boat. boat with that. <laughs> Smugglerauction.com. George, give us your plugs. Uh, yeah. So in addition to this podcast, I also host another one uh, with former Create a Pro champion Johnny Clash. But on this podcast, we call him what, Dylan? Cruz! Thank you. And uh, that podcast is the Game Marks podcast. We break down a different wrestling video game each and every week. And uh, if you wanted to check us out, you can find us on all forms of social media at Game Marks Pod. And if you would be so kind as to leave us a five star rating review uh, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and make sure to do the same for this podcast as well. Um, and also like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, do all those fun things at Game Marks Pod on all forms of social media, at Going Postal Pod on all forms of social media. But, Dylan, this is now everyone's favorite part because you're so good at doing this outro. Whenever you're ready, sir. Bye, friends. Hey guys, Magic Candle Company is the best way to bring your favorite vacation scents to your home. The smell of a tropical beach, dark water ride, a cruise ship, or even a water park. The Magic Candle Company is the best way to bring those nostalgic and iconic scents from your favorite vacation spot to your home. Visit magiccandlecompany.com and use code SWAGGLE to save 15% on your whole order and bring the magic home today.